This is episode 29 of the Life in Norway show. Norwegians are known as travellers, but today's guest takes things a step further. I'm joined by Gunnar Garfors, a Norwegian journalist and author who has visited every country in the world. We talk about where that ambition came from, what his travels have taught him about Norway's place in the world, and where in the world he thinks are the most interesting and overrated places to travel. You can find out more about everything we talk about on the show today on the show notes page. Simply head on over to lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and look for episode 29. Happy listening. I'm joined today on the Life in Norway show by Gunnar Garfors. He is a Norwegian journalist, globe trotter and author of uh, one book in English called How I Ran Out of Countries, and some upcoming titles in Norwegian also. Gunnar, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, David. It's not every day I have a Norwegian on the show, uh, more and more common these days. What interests me about you, though, is you spend most of your time out of Norway. So I'm really interested to know what inspired a boy from Hammerfest in the far north of Norway to travel the world? Well, that's a good uh, question. I think it all started when I was um, four years old, back in 1979. Um, my brother and me, we were, well, I was four, he was two. Uh, we were living with our mom on uh, in a small village on the Norwegian west coast. And our dad, he was working as a medical doctor on a cruise ship in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, of course, we couldn't read, so um, he sent us these audio cassette tapes with amazing stories from the Philippines, from China, from Japan, the US, Canada. And I just remember this making such an impression uh, on me as a, as a small child. Uh, every day we ran down to the mailbox um, to see if there was another audio cassette tape in, in one of these um, um, air, uh, air mail um, envelopes. Um, and of course, twice, twice a month or so, we were lucky and we ran back up to the kitchen and uh, put the cassette into the cassette player and, and press play. And I remember telling my mom that when I grow up, I uh, want to um, see as many countries as my dad. And uh, I guess I have done and, and then some. That, that's just such a lovely story. So these cassette tapes, were, was it like a personal journal or was he recording messages specifically for you? Yeah, no, it was it was for my brother and, and me. So he was mm. telling what he was doing, what he was seeing. And, and he's, he's really good at telling stories. Of course, there was also a letter to our mother. Uh, I, I assume he was writing <laughs> other other things to her. <laughs> but, you know, it was tailored to two little kids. So it was it was phenomenal. And it really inspired me as, as, um, as a young, yeah, young boy. <laughs> we'll, we'll come on to your books later, but do you do you pinpoint that as the moment maybe where you, you think you were first inspired to one day write a book? Uh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. And writing a book, I don't know, I didn't even think about doing that until I'd been to, I guess, 160, 170 out of the 198 countries. Yeah. And then I, I realized, you know, wow, I've experienced so much. I, I really should uh, should write this down. And I started doing that, and, and um, eventually I started calling every publisher in Norway, and they all turned me down. And suddenly, one of the publishers I had not actually called, they called me and asked me if I wanted to write a book. And uh, I said, well, if you twist my arm, I'll, uh, I'll think about it. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so, so writing a book about it came much, much later. But, uh, well, perhaps um, the stories of my dad might have inspired me to, to do so uh, sure. subconsciously. <laughs> sure. So if if you're, the purpose for visiting uh, every country in the world wasn't to then write a book about it, what was the reason that you, uh, you, you had this ambition? I mean, well, wh- wh- actually, when did you start with that ambition? I assume you, you had already visited a certain number before you said, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them all. Yeah, for sure. I, I started traveling uh, on interrail and by train around uh, Europe. You, you probably know this concept. You, you pay one ticket and it's valid for a month and you can travel as much as you want for uh, by train uh, almost all over Europe. And I did this uh, with a friend when I was 17 and it, I, it really 
open my mind being, you know, a village boy from the middle of nowhere, mm. uh, seeing different cultures, different uh, countries, uh, meeting people, trying different kinds of food and all the rest of it. And I, you know, the more I saw, the more I wanted to see. So, so I guess it's sort of, of, of start there. And then in 2004, um, my brother, who I told you about earlier, Einstein and, and me, um, we were talking about traveling somewhere. He's a teacher. So he's got a week off every autumn. And we said, well, let's go somewhere, but not to one of the, uh, uh, let's say, normal countries. You know, let's yeah. go somewhere special. And by coincidence, we read in the local newspaper about uh, a few engineers uh, from uh, Kyrgyzstan, they were visiting uh, the local area to to learn about um, um, electric power in general, or hydropower uh, from from waterfalls and all the rest of it. And we said, "What well, Kyrgyzstan?" And we hadn't even heard about it, so we started reading up on it. And uh, well, we decided to go there. Um, the only problem was the, the ticket prices were were they were really really um, high. It was so expensive to go there. Uh, but by coincidence, two days later, I was invited to speak at a conference in, in Kazakhstan, the neighboring country, one of the neighboring uh. countries. So I just immediately found my brother and I said, you're not going to believe this, but I'm, I've been invited to go there, which means, you know, the conference organizers, they will pay my ticket. So I will pay half your ticket and, and mm. then we could actually afford to go together. So, um, and so, so, you know, I went for the conference. He came a few days later and, um, we, we explored Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and we were, we were, um, almost notorious there. We were welcome in such a warm way, hospitality out of another world. Um, and I just, uh, it was phenomenal. And I decided, um, after that trip, I'm going to visit all the Stan countries, the seven mm. countries in the world ending with with Stan. And I guess I finished that a few years later, and then I needed another goal. And of course, I already like to travel and see new places. So um, then it became to visit all all the countries out there in order to, to see for myself and, and meet people and, um, you know, learn about uh, cultures and and, um, uh, and, and then see, see um, well, everywhere. Mm, <laughs> sure. Everywhere. So a lot of people listening to the show, they obviously have a very high opinion of, of Norway, they're people who have moved here deliberately, or they're people that want to move here. Norway is seen, I think it's fair to say, as a very good country in a lot of ways. Uh, it's it's a healthy country. It always comes in the, the, the top end of the list in terms of uh, happiness and uh, lifestyle rankings and these kind of things, quality of life. How now that you've seen every other alternative around the world, how do you perceive Norway? And could you talk a little bit about what you think Norway's place in the world is today? It's quite interesting when when you travel and you meet people from wherever. It might be Burundi, or it might be Tuvalu, or it might be Dominica in the in the Caribbean. Um, wherever you go, everywhere look upon themselves as the center of the universe, and naturally so. I mean, they are, of course, in each their own way. And then you also realize that, of course, many of these people have never even heard about Norway. <laughs> they probably have heard about Europe, but most unlikely heard about Norway and mm. and you sort of uh, so, so wherever you go it's it's quite fascinating to to um, uh, realize that you know everything re revolves about the people wherever they are and um, and we take so much for granted in Norway we have a high uh, standard of living we, we have a democracy good infrastructure we have a strong passport we, we have uh, we're pretty wealthy we have high incomes we can travel um, and and so on. So so I don't know. Almost wherever I go outside the Western world, I'm, I consider myself extremely lucky uh, in order to be from from a country such as Norway, and also to be able to travel elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And you see this now in the days of social media and about bragging and likes and all the rest of it. That um, you know, that's what we do when we travel. We put out photos and and we tell amazing stories about parties or weddings or dinners or you know whatever we've we've done, whatever we've seen uh, and and um, experienced. Uh, but very rarely do we actually stop to think that well, all these people that invite us to do all these incredible things in, in the countries we visit, 
lots of them or most of them perhaps will never be able to travel themselves you know mm, and yeah. and we don't even think about that we just take it for granted you know and, and just it's natural that we can travel and not even thinking about that well possibly they might want to do the same thing um, and it came to me in, in costa rica uh, and i i got talking to this guy and we started talking about traveling um, and, and I told him, you know, uh, about some story, uh, countries I've, I've been to and all the rest of it. And he, he said, you know what, this is amazingly inspiring to me. But, you know, I'd really love to be able to travel myself and I'm never going to be able to do that. And, it, and it, it came to me and I said, well, of course, you know, and it's really mm-hmm. selfish, really, not to to um, to look at this from from uh, other people's perspectives you know they might not even have a passport or, or their passport might be rubbish you know it, it's not might not allow them to go anywhere their government might not even let them you know leave the country they don't have the money uh no infrastructure they might not have the proper education they don't know, know how to travel i don't know there are so many limitations to to people from 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 elsewhere so so you know in, in that perspective coming from from a western democracy it's, it's it's truly truly amazing and, and i feel very privileged i, I am very privileged and, and very lucky to, mm. to be interesting now from what you've said you don't sound like a typical tourist uh you've mentioned several times already talking to to locals on your trips um what kind of tourist are you what kind of traveler are you are you somebody that that wants to you know see the sites do you try and see the sites or are you far more interested in in the culture and the the soul of a place yeah the latter clearly i i want to meet people i want to try to get under their skin to a certain extent at least i mean it, it, it's always uh, a limit to, to how much you can see and do when you're somewhere for for maybe only a week or, or even mm. less um, of course, there are some sites I, I want to see as well. I, I never use guidebooks. I, I prefer to to ask locals, people I meet, you know, what I should do, uh, mm. what I should see, and, and quite often they will invite me to to do something I would never be able to experience as a, as a typical tourist, you know, I see. Um, even by paying a guide or whatever, you know, mm. you're, you're invited to do something some, something special. So um, I've been thinking quite a bit about this lately when when researching and, and writing my, my second book, which is coming out in Norwegian soon. Um, and if you look at it, uh, you know, traveling, if, if, if you go beyond, uh, the, let's say, the normal countries, let's, see, let's say people like us from the Western world, uh, let's, if we leave the Western bubble <laughs> on our trips, instead of going to Spain and France and the US and, and Britain, uh, we actually go to, to countries less visited and we engage with people there. I, I think that will um, contribute and it will help open up the world. Uh, it will help um, lower conflict as well, you know, getting to know people from different cultures, getting to understand their their way of living, their backgrounds and all the rest of it. It will increase trade and all the and so on. You know, and this in turn will, uh, you know, lower tensions around the world. It can help eliminate um, armies or at least um, make them smaller. Uh, which again will um, uh, hopefully um, lead to, to to a smaller world, you know, and and take away this enemy picture that we have of, of many countries like Russia, for instance, quite often, and North Korea or Iran that are uh, so-called um, uh, what should I say bad countries. Mm. Um, and by doing that, you know, we we can um, and by taking down or. <laughs> minimizing the amount of, of firepower, uh, the size of, of armies around the world, that could actually help um, help, it with, help us with, with the green change that we have to go through. Um, people are saying, no, but, you know, you travel so much, you must have a really big carbon footprint. And I said, well, but if you travel differently, you know, you, you seek new experiences and you seek to, to visit new people in different places and learn about yourself and then... Um, then you know we can we can decrease tension and in turn um, lower the amount of, of military personnel around the world. And, and the armies, uh, the forces in various countries, they contribute to the, the biggest polluters in the world. So actually, by doing that, we can help lower emissions by traveling more. Even though that sounds uh, contradictory. <laughs> 
Is it these personal stories, these tales, uh, and the the things you're finding out about different cultures around the world that we can read about in uh, in the book How I Ran Out of Countries? I assume this isn't uh, the kind of book where it's one page per country with you know the the top site you visited. This is more about the people. Yes, it's it's about the people. It's um, people I met. It's um, stories. Um, so it's not a tour guide uh, by any means. It's um, mm. it's more like an inspirational, let's say, a journal or, or, or book. Um, of course, some of these countries I haven't been to in, in eight or nine years. So, so obviously, I can't say you should go. You should stay in that hotel or see that site, etc. It would be outdated uh, for some of the countries. Uh, but yeah, it's it's more like an inspirational uh, tale. It's so uh, there is one chapter for every country in the world. So 198. Uh, chapters, but I have themed them uh, a little bit strangely. I, I would say <laughs> they have been themed in in twenty one main themes or main chapters. Uh, one is island hopping, another one is is trouble with the police, uh, <laughs> and the, yet another one is is partying, and one is about girls. You know, you know I, I almost got married in Korea, for instance. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so every every country um, has been grouped under one of these. 21 main categories and yes yeah, yeah. so it's, it's it's all about stories and it, it's all about what i experienced and and you know meeting meetings with with various people i have to ask then about your your favorite countries um and i'm wondering actually whether from the the little tease of a story you just told there whether korea is one of your favorites or one of your least favorite countries <laughs> i i'm very fond of south korea i, I must say I've, I've been there more than 20 times uh, in part because of my my ex-girlfriend uh, but also through work and, and uh, because I, I really love the country. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely say uh, Korea is, is one of, of my favorites. I'm, then again, I'm, I'm asked some variant of this country. No, so, some, so I'm asked some variant of this question probably 10 or 15 times every week. You know, what's mm-hmm. your favorite country? Um, and I still haven't been able to answer that because there are too many incredibly amazing countries, um, you know, as and about so it's impossible for me to, to sort of say that's my favorite and that's my number two number three uh, so i've tried on occasion to come up with a list once i was interviewed by this american magazine and they asked the same con- uh, question and i said well i can't really answer that but i can give you 12 countries two from every inhabited continent that i can recommend anyone to to visit but you must promise me i told them that you, you won't range them from one to twelve you know, just randomly put them together. But of course, this was a magazine article, so it had to start somewhere. So they started with Romania. Uh, you know, it had to start with one of the countries. So within two or three days, I, you know, every um, paper, radio station and TV station in Romania started calling me and said, oh, wow, well, you've said Romania is the best country in the world. It's incredible. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, it wasn't exactly what I said. So no, 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 tell us why. why, why. <laughs> So, you know, that turned into to, to a funny, to a funny story. Uh, but yeah, Romania, yeah, for sure, it, it, it's it's a very underestimated country in, in, in Europe. Um, I don't know, Madagascar is, is certainly up there, being nicknamed the eighth uh, continent uh, mm-hmm. due to its, its wildlife and, and, and plants and, and, and diversity and all the rest of it. Um, I, you know, Iceland is, is truly incredible. So is Chile. Uh, again, a little bit similar to Norway, actually. It's, it's very narrow and, and long. And it's, um, it's got beautiful scenery down south. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, I can keep going and going, you know, just uh, naming countries. Again, also sure. the Stan countries where it sort of started. Um, Tajikistan, you know, the Pamir Mountain range. It, it's truly amazing. Um, yeah. No, there are, there are too many countries, you know, there are too many incredible countries. And, and again, you know, when people ask me this, they typically want um, a travel tip. But, you know, if random people I don't know, if they ask me, what's your favorite country? You know, I, I need a tip for, for somewhere to go. I said, well, well, I really need to know a little bit more about you. You know, what do you like? You know, I can recommend a country for you to visit, but um, I need to know your preferences. You know, do you like mountains? Do you like beaches? Are you going there with your wife? Are you going there with with your mates? Uh, are you going there with children, and, and so on and so forth? I get that question all the time in relation to Norway as well. I'm coming for two weeks. Where should I go? And you yeah. know, you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, "Well, 
Yeah, it depends. And, um, you know, people get frustrated at that answer. But, you know, the last thing you want to do is send someone up to to see the Northern Lights in the middle of the winter if they've never visited the Arctic before, because they're really not going to enjoy themselves. So (laughs) I I, I understand. (laughs) Okay, um, then perhaps a more interesting question then than your favourite countries would be, not the countries you've not enjoyed necessarily, but the countries you feel that are a little overrated for uh, for travel. Uh, the United States of America is, is vastly uh, overrated, and I'll try to explain a little bit why I'm saying that, because it's it's the dream country of, of, of a lot of us. I and do have a lot of US uh, listeners, I should just say, so uh, I'm, I'm very interested in your uh, in your. Your answer now. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, I, I don't mind at all. You know, but, but if you look at it, of course, the United States has been very, very good at creating the American dream worldwide, you know, exporting uh, their culture through films and music and TV series and, and you know, the, or, and merchandise and all the rest of it for, for many, many decades. Hmm. Um, so we have sort of been bombarded with, with the notion that the United States of America, it, it's, it's an incredible country. And yes, it is. It, and it's huge. It's very diverse. You can find almost everything there. But if you look at it from a different perspective, you know, we, we already know so much about the United States because of, of the films and the, the music and all the rest of it. Um, that if you can afford to travel to the, to the United States from Norway or from, from Europe, uh, there are so many more, let's say, exciting places, you know, that you know much less about um, that will uh, challenge you in, in different ways and, you know, that might um, expand your comfort zone in, in, in a way. So I think if, if you can afford to go across the pond, you know, to go long distance, um, I, I think there are many, many more, uh, let's say, exciting, more challenging um, countries that you can visit than the United States. And also, I must say, with the political climate there now, with with the person in charge there who's, um, well, being sexist and racist, uh, yeah, you know, uh, and, you know, not, uh, what should I say, talking down to pretty much every uh, group of people out there. I, I, I don't think that's, um, I don't really uh, support that way of, 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 of leading a country, or if you can even call that leading. But um, so, you know, that doesn't really make me want to go to the United States, having such a, a person in, in charge. Fair enough. Now, Gunnar, I have to ask you about your fellow countrymen and women here in Norway, because... Norwegians have a lot of holiday time, typically five weeks a year if they're employed. And of course, there's a reasonable amount of disposable income. Uh, and yet charter holidays, package holidays to the, the south of Spain or around the Mediterranean just seem to be so incredibly popular. Um, do you do you have a reason for that? Do you know why that is? Or, or, or do you think there is a, a, a change in that trend in any way? Well, firstly, I must uh, apologize on behalf of my uh, my uh, countrymen and women for, <laughs> for doing that and, and for traveling on, on such extremely uh, boring holidays. <laughs> but then again, I, you know, my two favorite things in the world are charter holidays and all-inclusive resorts in oh, one group. Oh, okay. And, this, really? and the second one is, is cruise ships. And let huh. me explain why. Because sure. these, these things, the cruise ships and the all-inclusive ho- and the resorts, they take away millions and millions of people every year and lock them up, so to speak, so that people like us that are maybe um, inclined to go to a little bit more exciting places, we are left alone without yes. all these millions of people. They are locked up in cruise ships and all-inclusive resorts. <laughs> so I love them as long as I don't have to go anywhere near uh, those kinds of holidays. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's sort of a joke. Um, and I, I really wish that more people would uh, indeed travel a little bit differently. I talked about it earlier that, mm-hmm. you know, expand your, your comfort zone, you know, learn more about the world, about other people, about other cultures and, and travel outside this this Western bubble. Mm-hmm. Why so many Norwegians do it? I mean, it, it's cheap. It's um, it's almost guaranteed uh, to, to give you really nice weather and a beach. 
And, uh, you know, as you know, uh, in Norway is not blessed with a lot of, of, of nice weather, <laughs> especially not on the West Coast and, and up north. So, so to sort of go to these beachy places, it's it's very appealing to, to a lot of people. And again, it's, it's cost, cost effect, uh, effective. It's easy. You don't have to think about anything. Everything is organized for you. You're being picked up in the airport by a bus and all the rest of it. It's um, um, but yeah, I, I guess it's, it's just in, in, it's very convenient and, and cheap. But to me, it, it's really sad that people don't explore more and, you know, learn more about the world and, and you know, challenge themselves. Well, to be fair, the the Brits are, are just as bad as the Norwegians when it comes to charter holidays to Spain. <laughs> um, one thing I have seen more of are trips to places like Turkey, and uh, Thailand seems to be a very popular destination among Norwegians as well. Are there any other up and coming destinations that you see more travel uh, from Norway? Well, you have um, what you mentioned in the two already. We're seeing uh, the Cape Verde is coming up. It's only uh. an hour and a half. Uh, further than the Canary Islands. Um, so it's sort of opening up. But again, people are going to Sal and Bua Vista, you know, um, all inclusive resorts uh, islands, when they instead should go to Sal Vicente and Santo Antao, which would give you, uh, you know, totally different perspectives um, and which would, you know, give you a new country. Going to Sal and Bua Vista is like you can go, you might as well go to, to you know, Spain or France, Majorca or whatever, Italy. Um, so, but yeah, that's that's one of them. Also, Sri Lanka, seeing more uh, visitors from Norway, it's, it's becoming quite popular. Also, India. And I mean, these two countries, they <clears throat> are a little bit more for, uh, let's say, experienced seekers. Um, mm. So, so luckily, people are people that go there are sort of willing to, to explore a, a little bit more. Uh, China is, uh, we see quite a lot of Norwegians go to China. And again, that's in the same sort of category. People are more into exploring, to, to learning about the country than to go to Thailand and, and, and stay on the beach. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, probably. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, you have all the usual suspects like Italy and Spain and uh, the United States and, and Britain and, and, and so on. Now, Gunnar, for somebody who is a professional globetrotter, uh, listeners may be surprised to hear that you're currently in Oslo. So where do you where do you spend your time and what do you spend your time doing when you're not uh, somewhere else, when you're back in Norway? Well, I, I have a normal job uh, when I'm not um, out and about writing books. You know, then I, I ask for time off and they give me time off without pay, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> uh, I have a job at a Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, NRK. So it's like the BBC, only much, much smaller. Uh, and of course, our language is, is Norwegian. So there are only five and a half million uh, of us. So here at NRK, I, I'm originally a journalist, but now I work uh, more with uh, project management and, and radio distribution. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's why I'm in Oslo, I guess. I, I, as you said, I'm born in the north, uh, northern part of Norway, and I grew up on the west coast, but now I live in, in Oslo, and I've done so for, for 19, 20 uh, years. And I must say, Oslo is, is a beautiful, is a really nice city, but, you know, the, 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 and, I, and I meet a lot of foreigners, you know, when I'm... I'm traveling, and I say, so where are you from? Norway. Ah, oh, Norway is beautiful. It's amazing. I say, oh, where have you been? Oslo. I say, <laughs> well, seriously, come on. Okay, yes, Oslo is a nice city, and it's um, a great restaurant scene and good for nightlife. But for scenery, seriously, you have to leave Oslo. You have to go to the West Coast and, and Northern and Norway. So, um, so a lot of people, a lot of foreigners are really missing out, I'd say, when they come to Norway by, by only visiting Oslo. Because Oslo you, is nothing. Do you get to travel much yourself within Norway? Yes, um, a lot. So both um, through work. I also have a small cabin up um, in North. My, my dad is from Narvik, and just south of Narvik, I, I built my own log cabin uh, together with one of my brothers. Um, so I go there. Um, it's a beautiful spot. There, there are no roads to my cabin, so you actually have to cross a fjord by your private boat because there are no um, uh, scheduled transport, no scheduled boats there either. So I have my, uh, together with my siblings, I have three brothers and three sisters, we have this little boat with an outboard engine uh, that we cross the fjord with to, to get to the cabin. And, you know, you have the beautiful mountains surrounding it, um, 1,744 meters just uh, behind my cabin. It's like a two, three hour hike to get to the top of it. There was so much fish in the, in, in the fjord. Um, the midnight sun in the summer, northern light in, in the winter. So that's also my 
a Norwegian paradise, if you like, that and um, Naustad, my village on, on the West Coast, where my mother and my father uh, and uh, three of my siblings still, still live. So I, I go there as, as well quite often. <laughs> it's very nice to hear that for someone who has travelled as much as you have, that you, you are still very much a Norwegian at heart with the cabin, with the boat and so on. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a very, as you know, that's a very typical Norwegian thing to to go to the cabin. I mean, most mm. families, I'd say, have at least one cabin, uh, typically either by the sea or in the mountain. So whether you like uh, swimming and, and fishing or whether you like um, skiing and, and hiking, you know, that's sort of how you pick where you should have your cabin. Mm. Uh, Good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> okay, Gunnar, uh, we are almost out of time. So I just need to ask you the three questions that I ask every guest on the Life in Norway show. Uh, what's the best thing about living in Norway? Well, it's um, uh, quite an open um, society. Uh, it's, uh, we have a democracy. We uh, have a relative uh, high income. So it's, it's a good place to, to live for also for education and, and health services. Mm -hmm. um, so and but maybe even more of that it's it's our appreciation of the outdoor we we just go for walks like randomly with no uh, other intention than than to go for a walk you know and, and breathe fresh air and sure. that um, scenery and nature and everywhere is accessible to everybody uh, that that's that's part of Norwegian law you know the the outdoor wherever the forest and beaches and everywhere uh, everywhere is accessible to to everybody and I, I think maybe that's the uh, one of the best things about living in, in Norway. Okay. What do you find most challenging about living in Norway? It's a relatively um, expensive country. Um, but of course, that's also a good thing because wherever you travel outside Norway, it, it comes across as cheap almost wherever you go. The most challenging uh, about living here, I don't know, we, um, we are shy. Norwegians are quite shy. And uh, that's a bad thing because we um, we don't even talk to people we don't know, um, and the shyness doesn't come doesn't come across as shyness. It comes across as arrogance to a lot of mm. people, which means that a lot of foreigners they think we are arrogant and nasty and and you know um, and, and not very nice people, uh, which is is such a shame because we we're, we're quite nice honestly, but we, we just shoot too shy to to say hello. And I, I keep trying to tell this to to um, well fellow Norwegians and also foreigners that uh, you know it's uh, yeah it's, it's only shyness and um, yeah. and then fellow Norwegians come on just it, it's free you can just smile or you know ask what time it is so you know break the ice one way or another just just say hello. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you heard it here, folks. Yeah. Uh, Norwegians are nice, really. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, will, I will put a link in the show notes to an article I wrote called Are Norwegians Rude? I think it's uh, quite appropriate to, to this discussion now. Uh, last question then, Gunnar. Uh, what's your favourite place in Norway? Well, that's it's a tie. It, it's between uh, Schumann, where I have my log cabin up north by Narvik, and uh, between Schumann and Naustal which is my village with 1,000 people uh, on the west coast between Ferda and Flora. And it's beautiful. And uh, my mom, she still lives there, and she has um, probably the most beautiful uh, view from, from a living room, you know, that's possible to get. Most beautiful view in the world. That <laughs> so that's, sounds that's, great. That's one of the reasons I started traveling. Uh, you know, I jokingly say sometimes to find out whether there is another view that's better than my mom. <laughs> and I still haven't found it. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, Gunnar, where can people find out more details about you and your books? Tell us uh, which books are out there and, and where people can find them. Well, the first uh, one that's available in English, it's called uh, How I Ran Out of Countries. And that's available online in any uh, online bookshop. Um, the second one is, is called Nowhere in the Norwegian or Ingenstad. Um, and it's it's going to be called Elsewhere when it comes out in, in English uh, a little bit later. Hopefully this year, um, I have a literary, uh, li literary agent working um, on, on getting that out. Um, but yeah, so the best, the best thing is probably you can, that people can find information on my website, which is garforce.com, or they can find me on, on, on Instagram or Twitter, where I'm just called Garforce as well. Great. And I will link to all those places Gunnar just mentioned in the show notes, which you can find at lifeinnorway.net slash podcast. Gunnar, thanks so much for joining me today. 
Brilliant, Dave. Thanks a lot for having me on the show. It was a pleasure. 